All right, so Acts chapter 4 uh, is where we are in this series on, on purpose, and we're going to read really the end of Acts chapter 4 first. We're going to get the end of the story, and if you were with us when we were in Acts chapter 2, you're going to think, well, this sounds a lot like what we read in Acts chapter 2. Luke ends this uh, chapter describing the community of Jesus. These people who have said, Jesus, you are who you say you are. And he describes them, again, quite similarly to how he describes them in Acts chapter 2. So here's the end of the sermon, the end of the chapter, Acts 4, 32 through 35. Now the entire group of those who believed were of one heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But instead, they held everything in common. Ah, so that's where we got the title for the thing. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them. For there was not a needy person among them, because all those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as any had need." Now, I've kind of had an assumption as we've read passages like this out of Acts 2 or even this morning coming and preparing for this sermon. Here's what I've assumed. I'll just tell you. My assumption is even if you're not a Jesus person this morning, which I'm glad you're here. This is a great place to figure out who Jesus is and what he's about. But even if if you're not a Jesus person, when you read about a community that uh, is uh, full of uh, just generosity and serving one another and lives are being transformed and people are worshiping, like you go, I'd love to be a part of that. Like, I don't even know about this whole Jesus thing, but I know I would love to participate. I want to be the kind of person that gives and cares for others. And then I certainly, at times in my life, I need people around me that will give and care for me. And so when I read a passage like Acts chapter 4, I'm immediately like going, okay, what's the recipe? What are the ingredients that I need in order to see a bunch of people come together and be marked by these attributes. And so I want us to kind of look at that this morning by going back to the beginning of Acts chapter 4 and reading the story that comes before it. I think the details of Acts 4 are going to kind of give us a a hint of some of the ingredients that it's going to take to see a community like this. But before we do that, we've got to like just let's take two minutes here and remind ourselves of like the foundation of all of this. This community is self-sacrificial. It loves others before it loves itself. It gives of itself. Is there a person that we talk about a lot at church who is the answer to every church question that you're reminded of when you read about people who love like this? Is there a name that comes to mind? Mark. Close, but Jesus. Yes, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is always the answer at church, right? So, like, I hope that when you see this, they're like, these people are living like, well, Jesus lived. I mean, they've like embraced how he walked, how he loved. They've even embraced his kind of like self-sacrificial love. Jesus says, pick up your cross, lose your life to find it. And man, these guys are doing it. And so it's important that like, before we get into the details, that we don't lose sight that like this, like underneath all of this is that when they said, Jesus, what you accomplished on the cross, I I believe the, the forgiveness of my sins that comes through your death, burial, and resurrection. I believe, I confess, my heart is in it. They didn't go, they didn't just like leave then the cross behind. But rather they embraced what Jesus has to say about, no, no, no. The cross just isn't a singular event. The cross is something that actually marks the way that you walk and operate on a day-to-day basis. Here's how N.T. Wright says it. He's one of my favorites. Here's, here's what he says about this. Jesus' death was not simply the messy bit that enables our own sins to be forgiven, but that can then be forgotten. The cross is the surest, truest, and deepest window on the very heart and character of the living and loving God. And when, therefore, we speak of shaping our world, we do not, we dare not, simply treat the cross as a thing that saves us personally, but which can be left behind when we get on with the job. The task of shaping our world is best understood as the redemptive task of bringing the achievement of the cross to bear on the world. And in that task, the message, the methods, as well as the message, must be cross-shaped 
through and through. At r and this spring, we talked about how uh, the invitation of Jesus is for you to ask yourself a really hard question. How in this moment, at this time, in this situation, can I put myself third? H- how can I lay aside my preferences, my ideas, and, and, and lay them down so that God would be glorified and that I could love my neighbor better than I love myself. It's a, it's a really hard and difficult question because if you're like me, uh, I know my preferences are the best. Like I know my preferences are the most right. And so to lay them down and say, here, we'll sing the song you wanna sing or we'll do this the way you wanna do this or we'll, you know, we'll choose that color instead of, I'm like, that's, that's hard, it's really hard. And yet this is the way of the cross and the invitation of Jesus is that we as a community, we have been called to be cross-shaped through and through. Uh, I think that's, is if, uh, I, I genuinely don't know, cross-shaped, is that one word or two? Can we just say it's one word? It's two? Bummer. Can we just say, let's just pretend, pretend I didn't ask and it's just one word. So cross-shaped, cross-shaped, I see I did it, cross-shaped. Oh, no, I wanted to be two words. Cross, shape, through, and through. Five words. Uh, if, you, if you've been to Sugar Girl for a little while, you know I like to say five words over and over and over again. For God and for neighbor. And, and make no mistake about it. For God and for neighbor, how can we be third and be cross, shaped, through, and through? Right? So don't, that, that, that's the foundation of it. That's the foundation of this community. That's the foundation of this Jesus thing that we're seeing. That's the foundation that I'm assuming you and I, when we read about that, we go, ooh, I'd love to be a part of that. Okay, so that's like the overarching thing. Don't miss that. Now let's get into the details of Acts chapter 4. So uh, if you were here last week, we were in Acts 3, and Acts 3 really starts the sermon for this morning. So if you missed it, here, here it is. There's a guy who's been lame since birth. He can't walk, and he's brought outside the temple gates every day to beg. And Peter and John, two of Jesus' disciples, they're walking into the temple, and the guy goes, hey, 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 he's trying to get Peter and John's attention, uh, presumably to get, just get some money to pay for food or whatever the case may be. And Peter and John, they get his attention and go, listen, we don't have any money to give you, but we will give you what we do have, and that's Jesus. So in the name of Jesus, stand. And he, he stands. Peter actually gives him his right hand, and he helps him stand up, and he begins to jump and move around because everything has been healed. And so this garners all kinds of attention. And then Peter and John do this absolutely beautiful thing. They go, whoa, 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 don't look at me. It's not me that healed him. It's Jesus. And it's his faith in Jesus who's healed him. So no attention, no credit goes to me. They humble themselves and say, no, no, it's, it's about God. And we just we wanted to help out this man. And so this garners all kind of attention. Uh, some people, because they're interested in what power is this that this lame man that we know can now walk. And then certainly attention from Jewish authorities within the temple who may have uh, interest in what's going on where they work and operate. And so here's Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 1. While they were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple police, and the Sadducees confronted them because they were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them, and they took them into custody until the next day, since it was already evening. And then I love, like, when something goes wrong, Luke always follows that with a, but, but don't worry, things are going to be okay. And here's what Luke tells us in verse 4. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. So uh, this is all happening in a temple and you and I are quite distant from a space like this. It's kind of hard for us to relate to what a temple is. I heard a pastor one time say, take the White House and the Statue of Liberty and combine it. And we're still not even close to understanding kind of the sacredness of this place. So here's just a couple of things. There's a, there are leaders that operate and work within the temple, a governing body. The architecture and the symbolism in the temple, they are all pointing to the story of the Jewish people. They're all trying to highlight and tell this incredible story. Um, It's sacred ground. It's a holy place. And and even within the holy of holies, there is this idea that God's space and humanity's space, it still overlaps. And this is good news because if you know your Bible, the first two chapters of your Bible say when God created everything, there wasn't a space 
where God's face and humanity's face didn't overlap. And yet our brokenness and our sin, we told God we know better than him, and it disrupts things. And so it's good news that even still, God did not go, well, you guys messed this up, you're dead to me, but that he's still here He's still present. He's still in this holy of holies. In fact, priests would bring their sacrifices, and they'd offer an animal, and this would result in the forgiveness of sins of the people of Israel. A select few, a chosen few, to operate this way. And so put yourself in their shoes. You hear that in like the lobby of the temple, there's some guys proclaiming resurrection from the dead, There's some guys talking about the Jesus who we had killed. He's now alive. And in fact, that guy who's been lame and sitting outside the gates for years, apparently he's walking around and none of that happened with us or in the place designated for that. You're running after them too. You're you're running up on them, on Peter and John and going, okay, I don't know what's going on we got to shut this down so you guys come with me until we can get the official governing body to decide what we're going to do with you hooligans who are causing a ruckus out in the lobby of the temple. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, here we go. So let's, um, let's read what happens next. This is Acts 4, starting in verse 5. The next day, their rulers, the elders, the scribes, they assemble in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. After they had Peter and John stand before them, they began to question them, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, which Luke 12, uh, go and read it this afternoon. Jesus promises his disciples, do not worry about what you will say. The Spirit will fill you. And Jesus is faithful to his promise here. So Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, rulers of the people and elders. Okay, so just hang out with me here for two seconds before we move on. Y'all know what a shout out is? Like you give someone a sh- you give someone a shout out. Oftentimes a shout out comes at the end of you receiving something and you didn't really like give something back. You didn't really have any money to pay for it. And so the nicest thing you could do was give a shout out and let everyone else know something happened. In the in the media world there are websites where you can download a free font or a background or a video, and instead of giving them cash, you can just log on to social media and essentially give them a shout out on social media, and the company will give you the free font or media file because it's almost as valuable as the money you would give them itself, right? Because then within your world, you're letting everybody know that this person has done something awesome and you should trust them. Now, this concept is present in the disciples' time. Oftentimes, uh, somebody of a higher status would do something nice for somebody who doesn't have much. The best they could do was give them a shout-out. There was no hashtags or social media or anything, but they would sh- give a shout-out, give a public thank you, because it would elevate the person who had done the good deed. Okay, remember that, because what Peter does is just so awesome. It's just so cool. Okay, Uh, here's what Peter says. If we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, so if we've been brought here today to be paid thanks and given a shout out for the good deed done to this man, watch what he does, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. He goes, man, hey, you, you, like if we're, like, Something good happened. So if we're here so that you can give us a shout-out, let it be known that we don't get any of the shout-out, but you can give it to Jesus, whom you had crucified, but God raised him from the dead, and who brings salvation even to you. Oh, it's so great. It's like I just, like, I'm like, come on, Holy Spirit, fill me up, because that's, that's legit, like, that's brilliant. No? Okay. All right, just me. All right. So anyways, do you, do you see what, all right, so now, Peter and John, 
They're like testifying about Jesus to the people who had Jesus crucified, the people who were involved in Jesus' trial. Go read about it in uh, the Gospel of John. And he's now saying to them, you had something done, but God had better plans. God had bigger plans. God raised Jesus from the dead, and this Jesus is still active and moving. In fact, the thing that you can't deny, the thing in which you are witnessing as this man stands healthy right next to us, it's because of Jesus and the faith in him, what like, what do like, you see how God just works and God takes stuff and you're like, oh no, our main characters have been arrested. What's going to happen? And God's like, they're going to talk about me and they're going to proclaim me and my purposes are going to be accomplished. Don't worry. Okay, here we go. Uh, so um, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, What should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem. We we can't deny it. But so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they've gathered Peter and John. There's an undeniable occurrence of something, but it goes against what they're about. And so they say, we we need to come up with a rule. Here we go. They can't talk about this anymore. And we'll let them know that this is now a rule. And we'll let them know that if if they do this again, the punishment's going to be harsher and stricter, which is common practice at this time. So they call Peter and John, and they ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And here's Peter and John's answer. Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we're unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done for this sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. You can hear the disciples saying, we've picked up our cross. We're witnesses to the one who died himself. We've lost our life, and in doing so, we found it. We can't help but speaking. We're we're cross-shaped through and through. We, we must be witnesses to what we've seen. We, we, we must continue to speak about what we've seen. Now, if you're like me, here's the temptation. I close the book. I go back to my original question of what's the recipe of a, of a community of people that holds everything in common and serves and loves, and we see people come to know Jesus, and I go, oh. See, they're like apostle-level Christians, and I'm, I'm way down here. And there are these areas in my life, like, so I'm a, I'm a husband, and I'm a father, and I'm a minister, and I'm an older brother, and I'm a son, and I'm an uncle, and I live in a city, in a state, in a country, on this coast. And, like, there are just ways in which I'm not cutting it. I'm not hacking it. I'm not apostle, MVP, varsity level. There are ways in which I hear opposition, I hear threats towards me, and I don't reply, well, I must. And so, Doug, today is the day. Today, it's, okay, tomorrow's the day. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning. I'm going to download that new app. I'm going to get organized. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to do it. I must. I must. I must. Jesus is counting on me. Come on, Doug. Look at the apostles. They, they like, stood up, and they're like, you can't threaten us, and even if you do, we don't care. We must keep speaking. And it becomes all about me. All my attention All my focus is on me and whether I can, we must it enough for Jesus. Now, slow down. Not stop on that, but I need to slow down and keep reading. Because we need to see what happens next uh, with our disciples. After they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the chief priests and the elders had said to them, here, this one's for free, notice. So they go back to their community, and they're like, hey, how are you, Peter and John? And they're not like, good. We're doing real good. No, seriously, like, how are you? We're great. 
Thanks for asking. How are you? How's the weather? No. Peter, John, how are you guys? And they report, well, the chief priest just threatened our lives. Remember, these are the people who threatened Jesus' life and then crucify him. This is a serious, like, my life has just been threatened, and they're open about it with the people who love them and care about them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God, and they said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the people plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, they have assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. Now, uh, we can quickly read through those things, but the, the disciples, when they started to pray, they're actually quoting from two psalms. And I want to read por- portions of those psalms to you uh, this morning. Uh, the first one is Psalm 146. Uh, and this is uh, how it goes. Hallelujah. It's, I don't have it on the screen. You'll just have to, sorry. Hallelujah, my soul, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to my God as long as I live. Do not trust in nobles and a son of man who cannot save. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the ground. On that day, his plans die. But happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who is the maker of heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, which is what the disciples say. He remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited, giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects resident aliens. He helps the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the way of the wicked. The disciples, they run in and they go, man, we just been, our lives have been threatened. We're facing opposition. And they go, let's go to God in prayer. And the first thing they do is say, God, you are the God who frees prisoners and opens the eyes of the blind. You're the God who raises up those who are oppressed. You are the God who is the creator and maker of all things, including us. So do the thing that you do. Then the next psalm that they quote from is Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord. Is this sounding familiar? They've just sat in front of these rulers and kings who are conspiring against the Lord and that's how the psalm opens up. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us because the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree, he said to me. You are my son, today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will shatter them like pottery. So now kings be wise. Receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the Son, or he will be angry, and you will perish in your rebellion, for his anger may ignite at any moment. But all, all who take refuge in him are happy. Y'all, like what, like, if you don't know what to pray, open up the Psalms and just read through them. Here, here's Peter and John, and now this group of disciples, right? Because Peter and John come back, and they're like, what happened? They're like, they threatened anybody who knows us. And I'm sure there's at least one person that was like, then what are you doing here? Go somewhere else, right? But like, the, the rulers have threatened us. People are against us. Our lives are at stake. And so they run to God as fast as they can, and they go, God, you're the God that comforts. You're the God that heals. And you're the God that laughs at the plans of those who are against you. They, they start their prayer by proclaiming who God is and how they desperately need him in that moment. And then here's how the prayer ends. And so now, Lord, not later, not if you don't mind, 
Now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they had assembled was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. The disciples, Peter and John, they stand before the ruling authorities who are threatening their lives and go, you got to decide whether it's good for us to obey you or God, but we must continue to be witnesses of the risen Jesus. And then they sprint into this community that we all want to be a part of, and we go, hey, would y'all pray? Because, like, we, we must proclaim, and then they go to God, and they go, God, you must provide. You must thwart their plans. You must go before us. You must continue to move. You must do the miracles that only you can do. You must enable us to speak with boldness. So so yes, God is calling Doug Robinson, husband and minister and father and all those things. He's calling me into ways in which I've got to like faithfully say, "I, I must, I must. And yet, if I have the audacity to then not run to God and say, but okay, God, that means you must. I'm hopeless, and you're hopeless too, and we're hopeless. We'll never be forgotten for neighbor. We'll never see community and diversity and generosity and service and transformation and worship flourish in this place if we just go, yep, God, we we know. We must, we must. All right, what's the plan? Let's execute the plan. No, no, no. We're a people marked by gathering together and going, cross-shaped through and through. Okay, God, that means you must be who you are. You must be faithful to your promises. We're totally and completely dependent upon you. And then the circle just starts. God, you've called me to, and so you must. And God, as you enable me to, I will, but you must. This is the life, what it means to follow after Jesus. This is the recipe for the community that is cross-shaped through and through. So, May, may we be a people, because it's hard, right? You got, you got, I'm sure you got bosses or families or situations that are staring you down and going, you better quit with that Jesus thing. Or that Jesus thing is about to cost you jobs or relationships, or you've got an unpopular p- opinion because you follow after Jesus and it's threatening you. May we be a people who say, but I must. I just, he's changed my life. I must. And then may we be a people who then run the family. When they go, how are you? We go, terrible. I'm doing awful. The Sanhedrin just threatened my life. I'm kind of nervous. I'm just a fisherman. Jesus isn't around anymore, but he is. It's not. What's going on? Let's pray. And they go, cool. They pray for you. They don't go, dude, you're an apostle. Come on. You got this. They go, yeah, we should pray. God, help them. God, do your thing. And they pray, so may we be a people who then say together, we, we must, and so God, you, you just have to. You, you just have to, because we're hopeless without it. I'm telling you, when we do this, y'all, th- thousands of people will just begin to like erupt in this Jesus, and I'm, and I'm telling you, uh, those who are opposed to you or to us will go, we don't like it, but we can't deny what God's doing. It's just, it's an awesome thing. So may we step into these things.